And our last talk of the night is from our last speaker of the night, also a good friend of mine, and for the first time here on the Otsalon stage, so give her a fantastic warm welcome to Kathleen Antonia and Fate and Fortunes of Sarah Rector. Thank you so much, and um, thank you so much, Christian. I'm having a really hard time because my, I have a nickname for Christian that includes the word bacon, and because he's curating tonight's... I know, I know, but I'm resisting. Uh, so thank you all for your warm welcome. Uh, thank you so much to my husband, Chris, who's here in the audience. You've already heard quite a lot from him here. Uh, he is an absolute rock star, a wonderful, wonderful person, mathematician, and I love him a lot. He would tell you that behind every great fortune are pirates. So we're going to start, with, and it's because he's descended from pirates. Um, could you actually, could I have a tech help right now, actually? Yeah, what's up? This, is, this is way too big here. <laughs> like that? That's much better, thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, don't, I didn't know how I was going to follow up a penis talk, but I guess that was a, a good way to start. So the story I'm going to tell you about Sarah Rector is um, also, there are a lot of pirates, and I'm actually no different because I've pirated much of my tale from Tonya Balden, who uh, in turn nods towards Stacey Patton's article in the NAACP's The Crisis magazine titled Sarah Rector, the Richest Colored Girl in the World. So who is Sarah Rector? The question you probably should be asking yourselves, more importantly, is why don't you know about Sarah Rector? And of course, the answer is pirates. So yes, our uh, the pirates of textbook publishing and pirate extraordinaire Hollywood, who has stolen awareness that is rightfully yours. As we know, and it was brought up a little bit earlier too, Hollywood's character depictions uh, warp your world so much, such that, for example, when you're thinking of the Negro Leagues, your mind completely skips Tony Stone, who was old too for a baseball player. She was 28 when she entered the league. Uh, when you picture the US Navy during World War II, you don't imagine gunnery officer Susan Oncutty. You certainly don't in your weekly chit chats about the Battle of Bull Run, because I know you have them. Uh, you probably are not bemoaning Hollywood's failure to showcase Loretta Hanetta Velasquez, who was 20 years old when she disguised herself as a lieutenant in the Confederate Army. And pirates have robbed your minds of expertise about the hero of tonight's story, Sarah Rector. What a cutie patootie, right? Yeah. The cutiest patootiest to ever strike it rich in the oil industry. Yes, that's right. So pirate Hollywood would have you believe that oil moguls, past and present, look only like this. <laughs> or this. But they sometimes looked like this. Uh, and Sarah Rector was not the only non-white, non-male, non-adult uh, person to make bank from black gold. But she is my current favorite a fellow Piscean, uh, born March 3rd, 1902, in Twine Indian Territory, a town named after William Henry Twine, who was nicknamed the Black Tiger because of his dedication to racial justice. He moved to Indian Territory in 1891 and was owner of several businesses, including a newspaper and a law office. But this is not where our story begins. Sarah Rector's story begins in Africa with the theft of some 20 million people who were stolen from their homes and sold into slavery. Half, 10 million people, I just want you to wrap your brains around that, died during the trek from the African coast. 20% of those 2 million people died during the Middle Passage. Their stolen humanity included torture, and forced feedings used to thwart suicides. So they weren't even allowed to choose death. Traded in Africa for iron, cloth, brandy, firearms, and gunpowder, those who physically survived the trip to the Americas were exchanged for sugar, tobacco, and other products. Family members were stolen from each other. These thieves took much. And they inspired an entirely new set of pirates. Among them were the very people whose native lands were stolen by discovery of the Americas. So this is Chief Apothle Yohola, 
whose homelands were in what we now know as Alabama and Georgia. His slave holdings included Sarah Rector's great-grandmother, Molly. Molly's husband, Benjamin, was owned by another Muscogee pirate, uh, Riley Grayson. Through a combination of bribery and brute force, mostly during the 1830s, Yohola, along with more than 20,000 Muscogee and tens of thousands of other Native Americans, were forced west of the Mississippi River in a journey the Cherokee called the Trail of Tears, in order that white pirates could obtain the rich lands of the southeast. The new homestead, 350 million acres, designated as Indian Territory in 1834, held jointly by the United States and England until 1846. The tribes that settled there tried to hold land in common, as was their custom. However, although patronizing and paternalistic pirate president Andrew Jackson uh, and the removal treaties, yes, themselves, promised sovereignty, treaties some tribes, including the Muscogee, never actually signed, well, we all know how this part of the story ends, at least where Indian nation land suffers further theft. After the Civil War, the US government declared that the five civilized tribes of Indian territory had forfeited their rights, annuities, and land claims when some tribal members fought for the Confederacy, perhaps alongside Loretta Hanetta Velasquez. Most Muscogee, called Creek Indians by pirates addicted to renaming folks, uh, fought for the Union. But when you're stealing land, why do truth and ethical rhetoric really matter? So new treaties reduced Indian territory from 350 to 20 million acres, and then the Dawes Act of 1887, uh, the US government divided that land into individual allotments, eliminating Indian territory altogether, along with any possibility of holding land in common. 20 years earlier, Reconstruction treaties required tribes to abolish slavery and make full citizens of those freed. So by the time the Dawes Act uh, and Sarah Rector's birth, she was a Muscogee citizen, due approximately 160 acres. Now, of course, the allotment of the acreage was not an act of nobility. The official goal of the Dawes Act was to assimilate Native American tribes into the dominant American culture. That is to say, the official goal was to steal and discard Native cultures. Sarah's allotment was considered bad land. And in 1907, I mean, that's not a surprise. Uh, and in 1907, it was worth $556.50 with taxes due. I mean, it's just like a pirate, right? To steal your property, give you a shit burger, and then say, pay me for it. <laughs> so Sarah was only five years old, so of course she needed a guardian, and her father in that role leased her land to B.B. Jones. You must understand that during this time, the discovery of oil was on the rise in what was now the state of Oklahoma. And it was so exciting that folks were sending postcards about it. Everyone hope, was hoping for a lucky break on bad land. Well, the bulk of Sarah's bad land allotment was on rocky banks either side of a horseshoe bend in the Summerin River near Tulsa, which was 50 miles from her home in Taft. And you may wonder why was it so far away? Pirates are dicks. Uh, but... <laughs> Ha ha, dick faces. Uh, Sarah's land gushed oil in 1913 to her profit of more than $300 a day. So then the headlines began, yeah. Negro girl has vast royalties. Millions to a Negro girl. Wealthiest Negro. This Negro business has its own interesting history, and by interesting, I mean whiskey tango foxtrot. Um, <laughs> Sarah did not stay Negro long. Black-owned newspapers asserted Sarah's membership in the black race, but white and native press most often described her as an Indian, the latter demonstrating how well the assimilation plot was working because indigenous traditionally had an ethnically-based system, and it was now replaced with a rigid race-based hierarchy. So it's not entirely rigid, of course, as we all know. When Sarah was portrayed as ignorant and feeble, white papers described Sarah instead as black, colored, Negro, Negress, Picaninny, or Afro-American. There was also an assertion that she was Spanish or Mexican. Then all Oklahoma Indians were declared white by law. Yada, 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 yada. Humans are crazy. <laughs> the pirates do not get her at this time. I'm just explaining because you look nervous. And your anxiety is well placed because Sarah was not in charge of her fortune. But don't fret. While grafters were common, these are pirate guardians who took advantage of wards, Sarah's loving father was in charge. Or do fret because when poor children or even poor adults became plute, which was slang for plutocrat, 
courts were famous for finding incompetence and installing their choice of guardian, usually a white man with community clout. So Sarah's new guardian was a white man named Thomas Jefferson Porter. Concerned that Porter was another grafter, the Chicago Defender newspaper, under the leadership of its founder, Robert S. Abbott, attacked Porter in print, going so far as accusing him of stealing Sarah away. And it's true that crimes, including murder, accompanied schemes to claim profitable lands, but Sarah did not stay missing for long, because it turns out Porter had been the Rector family's guardian for years, long before the oil money came in. Additionally, Muskogee County's judge, Thomas Leahy, was reported as a terror to bad guardians. And Leahy required every dollar of awards money to be spent only by court order. So pirates were everywhere, but Sarah seemed rather protected. And she needed them because she was loaded. By the time Sarah attended Tuskegee Institute in 1914, there were 50 wells on her allotment. Prairie oil and gas had the lease by then. Two years later, Sarah could by law propose her own guardian, and she nominated her father to join Porter. So of course that meant going back to court. But Leahy had resigned, and Glenn Alcorn had taken the bench. Because Elkhorn was connected with the Masons, the Elks, the Woodmen of the World, Phi Alpha Delta. Alcorn preferred a professional to Sarah's father. So then appears Milton G. Young, who was profiled in what seems to be the Jim Crow LinkedIn of the day, uh, which was an over 500-page volume of short biographies of white businessmen with a long and boring title. As you might guess, the Porter-Young partnership did not last long. One year later, in 1917, Porter resigned, but not for the reason you think, or the reason I think you think. It turns out Porter's lawyer, pirate Edward Kerr Jr., had since 1912 skimmed $8,500 on top of the $6,800 Sarah's estate had paid him for services rendered. Kerr loses his license. Young with the new joint guardian, Charles Looney, sues. Five years pass, and Sarah is officially a millionaire. I suspect Sarah got over the $8,500. More than a quarter million of her fortune was at that time invested in real estate, mostly farmland that was then rented out with additional income from US savings bond interest. Sarah and her family had moved from Taft to Kansas City and resided in what became known as the Rector Mansion where it would finally come to pass that in 1922, which is unfortunately the year her father died, Sarah was free from guardianship. And she behaved as one would expect a grieving oil mogul might. She bought real estate, invested money, splurged on clothing, jewels, and cars, including a silver-plated Lincoln. Uh, Yeah. Sarah defied Jim Crow laws that barred barred blacks from upper and white establishments, including using fitting rooms to try on clothing before purchasing. I know, a scandalo. Uh, <laughs> money, it can buy a lot. Then in walks a love interest, a younger man. He was 19, a football player at the University of Kansas. All right, so I know, yeah, I hear it already. At this point in the movie, we're all thinking, oh my God, Sarah, you are young and rich. What are you thinking about? Try to figure it out before it's too late. Well, it's too late. So. <laughs> During her marriage to Kenneth Campbell, Sarah birthed three sons and was rumored to have entertained Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Joe Lewis, Jack Johnson, and others of those ilk in the Rector Mansion, and at one time owned the entire block. Uh, Some recount that Sarah loved to speed around town and responded to traffic stops with the question, do you know who I am? Uh, Which apparently worked really well to avoid most tickets. She reportedly hired a limousine to chauffeur underprivileged children to school. Cool. And then the crash. And of course, there's no money. So by 1930, Sarah and Kenneth had divorced. Sarah's sister Lily died that year of tuberculosis, and Sarah lived in a modest house with one of her three sons, the other two living in Chicago with their father. By 1933, most of her Oklahoma properties were sold or foreclosed upon, her allotment going to Herman Epstein for $100 and other considerations. Uh, Some wells operated into this century, in fact. So in 1934, Sarah married William Crawford, and they stayed together until her death in 1967. Her wake was held at the Kerford Funeral Home, which is ironically the building that was the Rector Mansion. Yeah. Sarah is interned in Taft, Oklahoma, in Blackjack Cemetery, which sparks a new mystery because her birth year here on the grave marker is 1904 instead of 1902, which is what the official records indicate. So... 
What seems happily ever after until death to his part was not absent battles in the 1940s. Her son, Kenneth Jr., was shot to death, which the most precious possession stolen from her. But I want to raise our glasses to Sarah Rector and to her decades-long battles against pirates of every flag. May we protect her from those pirates stealing from us her story. <laughs> 